It's Nina here at Baby Chick. And Courtney from MamaStrong.com. Awesome, guys. So we are on two Facebook Lives, one at Mama Strong and one on Baby Chick. So I hope you guys are watching yeah, which video both of these. It's like a tennis match. We're like, oh, we're... Which, which video? So, but we wanted to make sure that we had all of our followers and readers making sure that they had access to what we're going to be talking about today. I mean that not so much. Um, so <laughs> learning from someone like that is so helpful and I'm just really excited to talk about this. So on both of our you videos, yes I will, but I want to make sure guys, <laughs> how, how things are during pregnancy, after baby, any questions that you have, and also be sure to say hi to us. We love saying hi to all of y'all where you're watching from. So make sure you say hi um, in the comments so we can give you a shout out and be sure and we'll answer all of your questions as well. And even the embarrassing questions. I think it's yes. important to know that this is like really safe to ask. Very the safe. The questions you might not usually want to ask. I know. Because you're behind a computer screen. So you can, you're safe. You you're safe in this it. setting. I'm going to be saying uncomfortable things. So. I, exactly. <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> But um, yes, to all of the Mama Strong people, if um, we haven't met, I'm sure we haven't. Uh, my name is Nina Spears. I'm the founder and owner of Baby Chick, and that's baby-chick.com. We are an online go-to resource for all things motherhood, and we cover topics from pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and parenting, and all the different topics. And I actually started off as a baby planner, a birth doula, postpartum doula, massage therapist, childbirth educator, newborn care educator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I realized that there needed to be a platform out there that really not only educates, but inspires and encourages and empowers women during these stages of life. And so we have some awesome writers and We've just been growing and um, providing great information like we're gonna do today with Courtney. Nina is amazing <laughs> and I wish I had had her seriously after I gave birth. So she's a wealth of information as well. So please follow her too. Yeah. That's what I feel about Courtney, for real, y'all. You're about to you're about to find out. So today so, pelvic floor, girl. Pelvic floor. When I ask the question to some of my clients, like, okay, your pelvic floor. People think they know what I'm talking they about, but don't. sometimes they really don't. So, mm -hmm. how would you describe, you know, if someone's like, okay, strengthening my pelvic floor, isn't that the muscle that like controls my my pee stream? <laughs> yeah, so that's that's what I hear a lot too. Yeah, that's yeah. what we know, and it's yeah. crazy to me because we're all grown ups, right? Right, right. This is our body. Yeah. Here we are at the age we are, yes. and we're finally learning about probably the most important part of the female body. It is the center of everything for us. Right. Um, if you think about where the nervous system is and how the nervous system functions, if the pelvic floor isn't integrated, um, then your behavior, your nervous system's behavior can't really be integrated either. So for women to learn about this, it should be like something you learn about in high school, honestly. Like, here's your body. But, you know, here we are at age 35, 36, 37. We're still learning our bodies. We're still, I feel like there's some type of shame of really understanding and knowing what your body is all about and how it works and and different things that you can't see yep. and the the importance of it so it's so true so true so the the pelvic floor is actually a very complex system totally we think it's one muscle right that we can all do we're all kegeling right now everybody's doing it <laughs> <laughs> where you stop the flow of urine and everybody yeah. assumes that's all there is well right. that's really only one area when we talk about a kegel it's only doing uh, sphincter work right that's only working the sphincter right and that's one component it's like if there was an orchestra that would be like pulling out just the violins right right in the orchestra that's just one part of the whole thing right so you know when we talk about the pelvic floor we're dealing with the perineum we're dealing with the coccyx we're dealing with lots of things it's a small area in the pelvis but it is it is very complex so the way I like to think about it, to visualize, because when we talk about anatomy, we all tend to shut down because the words are ridiculously awkward. Yeah. So I like to <laughs> use- confusing. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I like to think of the visuals a little bit more and feel free to look it up. I mean, Google is amazing these days for showing you the structure of the pelvis and giving you some um, anatomy tools and things like that. But in general, the visualization for work for women works really well. What it what it kind of looks like is a trampoline. Yes. At the base of your pelvis. Right. And uh, you 
want it to act like a trampoline as well. So you want all the muscles working in a way that create this uh, elasticity and this resiliency. Um, so in order for that to happen, it has to behave like that orchestra. Right. All the muscles have to be called in at the right time. Right. One can't come before the other, things like that. And really they work very well um, until we give birth or a lot of times with women um, before they begin their first kind of athletic you know, activity. Usually at that point we start to shift the way we work in our pelvic floor and we don't know. Right. So it takes a lot of relearning how to do it, making mm -hmm. sure we're tapping into the pelvic floor first. Right. Um, and we'll talk more about what that feels like. Yes. And the components. So it's not just kegeling, which I think we'll get into in a little bit. Kegeling is just one small part of the pelvic floor activation. And I think that's so important to know because even myself, I'm I'm fascinated and can't wait to learn all these new exercises that I can do because yeah, if you do think of it as a trampoline, if you're not taking care of that, it's just sinking lower and lower and especially carrying a child during your pregnancy, there's just more weight added to it and more weight added to it. So making sure that you have a strong pelvic floor is very important and you're so right. What I tell my clients all the time is, okay, you need to be doing your Kegels. You know, having a strong pelvic floor is really good for pushing, really good for uh, recovery after having a baby. But also there are some people that I know that are dancers or rock climbers who have the strongest pelvic floors ever. And they really should probably never do a Kegel in their life. In fact, they need to do, and I was one of them, having yeah. been a ballet dancer, right. ended up with two C-sections. A lot of what I had to discover was that my um, body was actually overtoned. My overtoned. My pelvic floor was completely overtoned. Yes. And I think you probably see the relationship of C-sections, diastasis recti, and prolapse very much having to do with this overtoning. So, so just uh, diastasis recti, can mm -hmm. you tell us what that is for any of our viewers that don't know what that is? Yes, it is the separation of the rectus abdominis muscle, also known as the six pack. So when you're pregnant, <laughs> I don't have one. <laughs> okay. When you're pregnant, you normally, it's a very normal process. The, the six pack muscle separates and it has to do yes. that. <laughs> it does. It does, otherwise <laughs> this beautiful baby wouldn't be able to grow. No. And in between the rectus abdominis is a tissue, connective tissue called the linea alba. And what it does is it stretches based on how much you're growing and allows room for the baby to grow. Right. It's a beautiful system. After you give birth, um, ideally what's supposed to happen is the rectus abdominis muscle starts to come back together. And when it comes back together, that linea alba can then uh, uh, heal and right. get stronger. So if you're wondering what a linea alba is, it's that line that you will see mm -hmm. forming at, during your pregnancy. Some people will be like, why do I have this dark line down my belly? Well, that's what Courtney is referring to. Yes. So if you didn't know what that was, I wanted to make sure awesome. um, that you knew. Yes. So after you give birth, like I said, you want this to come back together. And right. when that comes to back together, it then takes the pressure and the tension off of that connective tissue right. and allows it to heal and go back to the way it used to be. In this culture, however, diastasis recti becomes a chronic condition, which is where it becomes abnormal and a problem. And when it becomes chronic like that, um, basically the rectus abdominis muscle stays apart and that linea alba stays stretched. And so over time, when you're carrying babies and you're breastfeeding and you're going about your life, um, it gets more and more stretched out. And that's why a lot of women end up with um, what we call the pooch. And it's because that hasn't pulled back together and the tissue in between hasn't healed. And a lot of women end up with a small hernia um, in the belly button. Which a lot of people aren't even aware of and they don't know how to check it. They yeah. don't know how they can correct it. And these are things that we'll I'm sure talk about another day. Um, but. But that's also something, if you want more information, visit mamastrong.com. She can help with all of those things. Yeah. But yes. And that's very much, the di uh, uh, chronic diastasis is very much related to pelvic floor not working properly. Exactly. Because what happens is, is if the pelvic floor isn't working well, then the rectus abdominis muscles can't come back together. And that's when you end up with the problem. So what a lot of women do is they start, you know, they feel all poochy and yeah. disconnected and they start doing normal ab exercises, which are like crunches and all the work that they were doing before, but because the pelvic floor isn't integrated, what they end up doing is strengthening the rectus abdominis in a separated position. And I would think just from thinking of like the mechanics of it all, when you are crunching forward, it would probably separate Bingo. your ab abdominals even more, Bingo. which would then make that 
diastasis, so recti, sorry, <laughs> um, even worse. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, I would think that the, that's counterproductive to it what does. you're trying to do. So, but you're saying that having a strong pelvic floor can really help you. One, you're saying with you the C-section thing. Yes. The diastasis recti, yep. and what else? What was the other one? Prolapse. Which prolapse? I don't know about which you. Which a lot of people don't even know about. Don't Google it. That's before, all about. <laughs> before we move on to prolapse, I do have a question yes. here over at Baby Check, and from someone who'd like to learn more about preventing a diastasis recti in a second pregnancy after having one in her first. Oh, that's all you, Courtney. That is a fantastic question. So, um, and is she pregnant already? It sounds like it. Yeah, second sure. pregnancy. Yep, okay. Like, yeah. Second pregnancy, so at that point, um, you wanna make sure you're just doing some bracing moves, which we'll talk about. I'm gonna teach you all a bracing method just through breathing here at the end um, that you can do even when you're pregnant. Um, what you wanna avoid is a couple things. So while pregnant and having dealt with the diastasis before, you wanna make sure that you're not lifting really heavy objects over your head. Now I will say that most of you have kids and so that's kind of a terrible thing to say to a mom. Like, oh, here's the way to help you, don't lift your kids. I mean, it's Yeah, that's it's ridiculous. Kind of <laughs> so I know you're gonna pick up your kids. The best thing to do is to use your arms. Make sure that you're using your arms when you pick them up and um, you know, do the bracing method that we'll teach at the end. The other one that a lot of pregnant women don't do and aren't careful about is uh, extreme rotation. So if you've had the diastasis before, that rotation, if you think of what's happening in the tissue in there, it's really gonna stretch it out a lot more. more. Okay. So things like diagonal poles and stuff like that, you just wanna avoid while so pregnant. So none of this crisscrossing. And another one that becomes a big deal is when traveling while pregnant and you're lifting luggage up over just ask for help for those things. Any extreme rotation is not great. But you're gonna show us an exercise to try and help with that um, if someone's already pregnant, just yes. so then they don't have it yes. after their second pregnancy. The other one is hip flexors, and this goes for everybody, but especially pregnant women. Um, you need to make sure that your hip flexors are released. And um, that, you Which, know, there are some great stretches that you can do. Yes, so. Very good stretches, you can also just get a lacrosse ball and kind of lie down on your side um, and take your leg out and kind of roll, push the ball into the hip flexor and roll through. Uh, the reason for that is while pregnant, because of the way that your pelvis is shifting, the hip flexors take over and get really strong and overwork, especially if you have previous diastases. Mm -hmm. So by releasing the hip flexor, you pull the pelvis back into the right spot and give more space for the abdominals to do what they need to do. Right. But don't be afraid. I think a lot of pregnant women who suffered from this before get really scared. Every little twinge, every pain that you have um, feels really frightening. That something's ripping, tearing. I hear all sorts of words, which oh, you probably do too. Yeah. So just take it easy and know that your body, you know, the diastasis is not abnormal and not bad. It's a normal process. The question is, how are you going to arm yourself for when that baby comes? Right. Um, so right now, your body's doing actually what it's supposed to be doing. You should have a diastasis. It's how long it stays after that becomes right. a problem. Or how far apart how far apart that happens. Because I was gonna say, I know that you've probably worked with some women where you can fit like a full four fingers in between the two abdom uh, abdominals. And you know, some women it's only two after mine having was, a baby. Mine was six. I was oh. six fingers separate. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't even know that that was like a thing, that yeah. it could be that far apart. Yeah. So, and obviously you've recovered, so it's doable. It's, it's not totally something that you have to be stuck with. Yeah, yeah. So, but back to pelvic floor, yes. having a strong pelvic floor can help avoid all, a lot of these issues. Right, because we tend to think of abdominal strength happening from the six pack muscle, right? Right, right. And that's actually not true at all. All it helps you do is bend forward and come up. That's the function <laughs> of that muscle, right? <laughs> and so when we see somebody with a strong six pack, we tend to think, oh, their, their abdominals are really strong. strong. Right. Not true, it just means that they're a cheap date. It means ah, that they have low I'm body fat. I'm gonna say that now. <laughs> <laughs> it means that they have low body fat. We all okay. have a six pack muscle. Yeah. Um, I, know uh, that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I believe mean, there. And if you get to a certain body fat percentage, you'll see yours too. Okay. And that's not always healthy for most people. Right. Um, some people it's going to show up more just because of their muscle tone and their body fat content, and some people not. So um, when we talk about real abdominal strength, we're actually talking about pelvic floor strength. Okay. So when the pelvic floor is starting all abdominal work, then the rest of the
the abdominals work well. Right. So we talk a lot about core, and for me, I'm like, ah, core is really secondary. Okay. First has to be, is the pelvic floor launching and starting all the movement? Because if it is, right. then the core work is easy. Then the So deep down in the abdominals, you have a muscle called the transverse abdominus. Right. It's a very deep abdominal muscle, and it wraps around the middle like a belt. This is actually the most important muscle for women after birth. And it's below the rectus abdominis, below the six pack. And it's actually what it connects to the pelvic floor. So when right. the pelvic floor is working right, it then triggers the transverse abdominis to work, which then triggers all the other muscles to work. Mm -hmm. So if you're really starting from the pelvic floor with this method that I'll teach them, um, then everything else works perfectly. Ah, mm -hmm. that sounds lovely. So you no longer have to think of all these crunches or these side things, you can just think of pelvic floor first. And these are things that are safe to do during pregnancy, after and after baby. Or yes. How soon can you do these after baby, Courtney? I love this question <laughs> so much. Uh, you know, we all know that after you give birth, they say not to do anything for six weeks. No um, exercise for six weeks is what, yeah, most people will say. And you probably know that this is very smart because there are some women out there who would go out and do CrossFit or throw tires down hills. Yeah, and run a marathon. Run a marathon. I've yeah. seen it before. <laughs> yeah. um, and we understand why that impulse to get moving and get back to yourself is so, that yeah, strong. Yeah, of course. So what usually happens is we send women home and we say don't exercise, don't do anything. And that's really dangerous because that's a period of time where you're doing a lot of physical activity. Mm -hmm. um, you're also sleep deprived. You're also, your adrenals are a bit shot. Um, hormonally, you're going through a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot happening that is actually the time where you need the most pelvic floor strength. Right. So what I have discovered is that you don't necessarily have to exercise, but just use your breath and you use a dynamic breathing method to work the pelvic floor, and then it kind of fits in, because you're gonna be breathing anyway, right? Right, right. So, <laughs> why not do it dynamically? Right. And then it doesn't count as exercise. So anything I teach, I make sure I don't use the word exercise yeah. when it's that six week period. Right. Um, I talk about dynamic breathing rather than exercise. Which is so important because I think Women really need to understand that during that time after having a baby, you really need to recover. You just gave birth to a baby. You just delivered the placenta. If you think of where the lining of the placenta was in your uterus, that's a huge gaping wound that you have inside your uterus. All of that has to contract yes. and be able to stop the bleeding and to heal and get back to eventually its little plum shaped size. So when you overdo it, that's when you're gonna see the spotting again and that sort of thing. So I love how you say it's not necessarily, it's not an exercise, but it's a breathing technique that you can do, but it still is helping you recover and helping you stay strong and helping you um, from avoiding, you know, prolapse, those kind of things. Yeah, it becomes really essential and it's, it's very basic, but I actually teach women that while pregnant in the last trimester that they should start learning the bracing method and prepare themselves for right after birth. And if you can, whether you've had a C-section or a traumatic birth or a regular vaginal birth, um, in your hospital bed to start that movement. Mm -hmm. And the reason is the nervous system has to be challenged into a new way of doing, a new way of being. It needs to know that number one, it's safe. Number two, this is the new language, right? right. I've been pregnant, but now this is the new language of my core. Right. And just by breathing and isolating the pelvic floor, that starts to happen. Right. When we are told not to do anything, what happens is the body still has to function. Mm -hmm. And because we're not integrating the pelvic floor, it starts to use other muscles to do that instead. Right. It has to keep going. So then that's when it starts to work the hip flexors. Right. That's when it starts to work your upper back, things like that that then cause more problems later. Mm -hmm. So it's really important at that moment, you know, you meet that birth with just agreeing to integrate the pelvic floor. Right. And then also you're getting the relaxation from the breathing. Um, and I truly believe that there's a change in a woman's behavior when her pelvic floor is integrated. Right. And if we think about just that on an animal level, it makes sense. Because right. our nervous system feels safe. It doesn't feel like it's shattered. It has some information for how to move securely. And so uh, you then behave differently. So true. You, you, you handle stress differently. You handle your partner differently. You handle modern motherhood. You know, differently. Like the weird yeah. invention of it. You handle, <laughs> you handle that better. So. Yes. I, I think that has to start first. We focus on the emotional, we focus on that stuff, but I'm kind of like, let's dial it back and focus on the animal of the woman. Right. What does she need? Mm -hmm. And that seems to be really helpful, just, just simple breathing. And I think this is such a great tool as a postpartum doula, that's something that we are constantly making sure that, yes, that baby is okay, but 
is the mother okay? Mm -hmm. Is she taking care of herself? Is she eating enough, drinking enough water? Is she recovering into this you know, new person that she is? Because not only are, I always tell people, not only are you giving birth to your baby, but you are birthing the mother inside of you. Yeah. You are becoming this new, this new person that you've never been before. And to learn these kind of tools that can help you during your pregnancy, and after baby are just essential. And so as a postpartum doula, I am so excited to learn these techniques. Yeah. Um, and it's the bracing method that you said. Yes. Um, so then that way we can, I can one, practice it for myself, but yeah. also be able to share this with other women. And hopefully you guys um, are sharing this as well. Yeah. So. so we have a shout out over here from Baby Chick. Yay! Vanessa says, hi ladies, great topic. I'm glad I finally got to catch a live video. Yay! Thanks, <laughs> Vanessa! Hello, Vanessa. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. So, yeah, I'm I'm really interested and excited to kind of see, is, is now the bracing method, is it going to be different when you do it um, during your pregnancy and after, or how does that, how does it all work? Um, it, a little bit different. So while pregnant, I don't want it to be as extreme as it might be after. Because okay. again, we're focusing on that overtoning, but also your body, you know, the posture's different, your pelvis is different. It's not gonna really feel the same. A lot of women say, I can't feel anything down there while right. I'm pregnant. And I'm right. like, well, yeah, that's because <laughs> that's kind of, everything shifts. It's, it's all baby. It's all baby. So it's pretty normal that they can't feel anything. Right. So right. I do try to cue a little bit differently, but in essence, it's exactly the same. Okay. Um, what we really focus on right before delivery with women is uh, making sure they are releasing. So there is this panic, I think, because we have a lot of information out there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a panic about uh, not getting your body back, um, about prolapse, about all these things. So women tend to really tighten up. Right. And I think it's important to learn to release. It's actually a lot harder to release a Kegel than it is to contract it for most women. Really? Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Why? Because we've been taught since we were a little itty bitty that that squeeze. Uh, squeeze. I mean, if you've done any dancing <laughs> or anything like that, it's yeah. really like squeeze or tuck Tighten in. and tone. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also most women, if you look, you can watch people when you're standing in line, uh, you know, at the grocery store. I, I, I try not to look. <laughs> I, I want to save them all. But like, you'll notice that most women stand with their hips tucked under a bit slightly tucked under pelvis and that's because I think since we were very little we were told to have a straight back um, a lot of people were told that they have a sway back um, oh. things like that especially if you were a dancer or anything but I also think it's that hiding posture that we go into and it's a tiny I'm talking like the pelvis should tiny sit like pelvis this tilt. it's a tiny bit and as soon as that happens um, it starts to change the dynamic of the pelvic floor so yeah all those things become really important it's crazy, crazy. Oh, just little things like that little really things. do you add up Oh my gosh. So tell me about overtoning. Yeah. So overtoning happens when the pelvis is actually tipped a little bit like that. Right, because right. when that happens, uh, the hip flexors take over and then the pelvic floor doesn't have the elastic feel anymore. It's right. now reactive. So it's having to hold on for dear life. Right. Now, we don't know this is happening because our nervous system just wants us to keep going. Right. Its job is equilibrium, homeostasis, right? right? And so when we start to make these small shifts, uh, we don't know it's happening. We don't even feel it until we start having pain. So we start having pain in our back. We start getting sciatica. Um, our knees mm -hmm. hurt. Our hips hurt. Uh, shoulders hurt. That's how we know that that system has changed. Overtoned. Okay. So that's when you're overtoned, you'll usually end up with pain in your joints, or usually while pregnant, you end up with sciatica. Right. Or SI problems. SI. Yeah. We have a shout out for Mama Strong. Yeah, oh, yeah, Mama Strong. Jody says, You're so amazing, Courtney. Thanks for <laughs> all is. you do. <laughs> Hi, Jody. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, so so something that also with overtoning that a really strong pelvic floor that I've seen, at least as a birth doula, something that I see in the labor and delivery room is women that baby is not able to drop as low as it should, which is why we were talking about needing probably a C-section because it is so toned, even though as much as you are breathing and relaxing and moving those hips, if you have an overtoned pelvic floor, so again, that's that dancer, that, that rock climber, people like that, it's just not a, able to really get baby down low. So that's the, this is the thing for me. For me, I know I need to strengthen my pelvic floor because, you know, 
I'll pee a little bit when I when I sneeze. So that's not good. Um, but for the people who do have such a strong pelvic floor, how do you get that nice soft spot? Like when are you, you know, for people, you, you probably know if you have a weak pelvic floor, um, but do you think people know if they have an uh, overtoned pelvic floor? They usually don't. Like I said, it usually shows up in weird pain things. Okay. Um, usually outside of it. Now, as a lot of amazing doctors have been trained and physical therapists, like right. when somebody comes up with knee pain, right. they either can't deal with it this way in a functional way, or you know they haven't been trained to think of it that way. Right. Right. Um, they are now. It's, right. It's uh, pelvic floor medicine is becoming an incredible new thing. So. Uh, you know, somebody comes in with knee pain. Now I know that the problem might be in the knee, but that most likely this woman's pelvic floor is overtoned. Okay. So um, I would say in general that if if most women are overtoned, especially if you've been very athletic, um, and this gets into a tricky area because we don't want to tell women not to be athletic, right? Of course. Yeah. We don't want to tell women not to exercise while pregnant. Right. Or, not to do really, you know, intense work. I, yeah. So I, I'm careful to draw that line. Right. What I am saying is that there needs to be a new framework for how we train women, mm -hmm. because the the position of the pelvis is essential. Yes. And making sure that all of the movement comes from the pelvic floor. So you know, whether it's your daughter or um, any young child, they should, as a woman, they should be taught how to work with the pelvis in the right position and how to activate the pelvic floor first. And then the beauty of that is that then they would go through life with a much healthier body, that things would work much better. So that. otherwise, yeah, there are most women that I deal with are overtoned. Overtoned. Wow. And so overtoned I wouldn't actually, think that. <laughs> over oh. overtoned actually shows up as a weak pelvic floor. So often when it's super tight, it's like it, it no longer can function as a trampoline. Right. And that part of our body needs to be resilient. Right. And so especially for pregnancy and birth. Especially. So yes. if it's super tight, suddenly right. that structure is a very weak structure. Wow. It's like uh, another good description is a bridge. So if you've ever noticed with a bridge, first off, the structure is a curve, right? Right. Because it's the strongest structure. Right. But the other thing is, is that the bridge has lots of space in it. Yeah. And it's held up with a lot of wires in different places. Right. And that's because the bridge has to have movement. Right. If there isn't an ability to move a little bit, then that will just crumble immediately. And right. the same is for our pelvic floor. It has to have that movement. Right. So if it's just told to hold, like flexing a bicep so hard, right. then it actually becomes really weak. And most of us have done the type of exercise. So I would say for for most women, especially when they're pregnant, as much as I want you all to exercise, yeah. as much obviously as yes. my business, yes. <laughs> I, I, want, I want everybody to relax a little bit. Right. And make sure that, you know, this whole idea of squeezing and, um, you know, crunching, that that starts to leave our vocabulary. That we kind of go into a little bit more primal sort yeah. of relationship with our pelvis. Uh -huh. Even in yoga, for example, they talk a lot about tucking your hips under. Right. Now that's not yoga's fault. That's a mistranslation of what the real Sanskrit word is. Yeah. So when you're in a yoga position and they're right. telling you to tuck the pelvis under, right. that's the way we've translated that term. Huh. What that Sanskrit term really means is heavy pelvis. But here in the West, we don't know how to teach that. We don't know how to teach keeping the pelvis back in a very primal position. We only know clench and tuck clench and hike. Yes, <gasps> yes. So I would say for a lot of women to really get grounded, to feel their pelvis get, being very heavy, and to be okay with the curves in their back. Right. Which is hard for us to do. It's so hard for we us to do. We have a comment from Mama Strong. Oh, yes. Ashley says, this is so helpful and great timing. Yay, <laughs> Ashley. Ashley. So glad. Great timing. So I, I'm assuming that this is baby or right after baby. So congratulations either way. You need to go find baby too. For Aww, sure. you're so sweet. Well, this is super helpful for me. This is perfect timing for me too. <laughs> so I, yes, I'm. Have you been, have, did you, what type of exercise do you do? <laughs> Why? It's good if you have all four Y'all, I am not that that involved with exercise. I will be completely honest. I wasn't either. I remember I used to turn on those yoga videos. No, I wasn't. The Pilates instructor no, before, I hated it. right? I, hated it. I would actually <laughs> turn on those yoga videos and I would lie down 
and I would like do the first thing and then I would just watch because they were always in unitard <laughs> and there's always a fountain behind it. I love it. It's, it's like so Jane Fonda. Hey. And they always have like camel toes right that's TMI. But I, know, I don't know. It's like, great. Why pregnant women in unitard. Too. I know. So then I would just end up doing the Savasana thing at the end. And that was that's it. my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> well for me, so walking, I do a lot of that mm -hmm. um, whenever I am doing something. Um, but I know how important squats are. Yep. So I'm doing um, as many of those as possible. I'm, I'm doing um, mainly a lot more stretches yeah. than anything else because I just want things to be able to move. So when I'm in labor, I'm not feeling, you know, just tight or, or unable to get into a position that I think would probably make me feel a lot more comfortable when I'm ready to have my baby. So I'm doing a lot more of that. I am doing a little bit of weights. Like um, I went to the gym this uh, this weekend and I'm gonna try and do better and go more <laughs> often. Um, so, but yeah, I've been doing a lot more of like the walking and the stretching. And my midwife just recommended that I start going to the pool and doing that. Great. So um, my mom has a great pool at her condo. So I'm gonna go start doing that as well so those are the th that's what I'm going to do but yeah walking and stretching and a little bit of weights like very rarely but yeah. th those are those are the things because I know you know what I'm not supposed to do isn't um, it funny but though? I need to be d I, I know yeah. yeah isn't it funny though you this is what this is what I always hear is that <laughs> pregnant women feel like they're not doing enough like there's some sort of train yes. in front of them that's like wellness and health and it's going far away and I'm like gosh you're doing enough like yeah just listen to your body that's so true and it's just not a, like everything's gonna be all right yeah and I think it's important for pregnant women. and I truly believe that like in my gut <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everything is gonna be okay and I feel like things are going well and my baby's growing at the right pace and I'm growing at the right pace even though I feel like I look ginormous <laughs> because I'm five foot one so, um, so my baby just goes straight out but um yeah, I, you're so right. I think we are really hard on ourselves, especially after having a baby, like getting back to your pre jean size. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you took nine months to grow that body and baby. Like you need to give yourself some time to recover and, you know, but do it in a smart and healthy way. And there are exercises, again, Mama Strong, great, great resource to be able to learn how to do that. And so again, a muscle group that people do not think of though is the pelvic floor yeah. and that's why I thought it was so important for us to talk about it and why it's important to take care of it during your well always but especially during pregnancy you can do it immediately after birth immediately after birth. immediately after birth like yes. that's not you can't do that in you know for other exercises you just can't so for something that you could do immediately after birth and beyond and yep. that it can help you with so many different things. Something else that I wanted to say that I noticed with an overtoned yeah. pelvic floor is not only that babies aren't able to drop as low, but also pushing. That's a great pushing question. is a little bit um, mm -hmm. less, either they are super great or it's ineffective and it's just too tight. It's too really? much. Yes. So how do they struggle? What does that look like for them? Um, pushing takes forever, and then we need a C-section, or we need a second. Um, we need a second um, uh, intervention, a uh, second stage intervention. So that's a vacuum or forceps, uh, an episiotomy, things like that. Yeah. So um, because they, it's just everything has been too tight. Everything's too tight down there. So we need to do an episiotomy to open it up. We need to do a vacuum. We need to do all these things. So something that again, I know that I'm not, um, I don't have like the strongest pelvic floor, which in this sense is like not a bad thing, but I do need to strengthen it. So I am doing my Kegels, but I'm excited to learn this new um, method as well. But I also, I've been, I wrote a post about how to like minimize your chances of tearing during childbirth, um, mm. because I think it's so important. And there's this product Unfortunately, you cannot get it in the United States. I was going to say, Sorry. No <laughs> yeah. it's it like is. Dutch. <laughs> um, but it's called the EpiNo, and it's basically like this dilator that you place inside your vagina, and you pump it up, 
and you slowly grow it over time. I think you start it, they recommend it at 36 weeks. I think you can start it as early as 34 weeks and it helps stretch your tissues and it's uh, helping you release because in order exactly. to do that, you have to like surrender that a bit. Exactly. Wow. So people who are overtoned haven't learned how to really release that part of their body and it teaches them how to do just that. So normally if you have something like that, it's like a, it's like a pelvic floor um, or a, a Kegel a Kegel exercise thing that you have to squeeze on it, squeeze on it. This is the exact opposite. You place it inside oh, and it, you have to push it out. What? You have to push it out. Well, I mean, you can pull it out and do that, but they recommend that when you place it inside, you hold it and you stretch as, you know, you blow it up more and more as you go throughout your pregnancy. So it helps stretch your perineum, but then it recommends that you push out the epino. So then that way, when you are ready to push out baby, it gets all the way to 10 centimeters. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? So people who have, are, are already, knowledgeable and know that they have a strong uh, pelvic floor, I say, hey, do you have any friends going to Europe or Canada or <laughs> anything at all? Not the United States um, because they don't sell them here and you can't order it like online and ship it here. They won't do that. So I had like one of my um, doulas was going to Israel and she bought a whole bunch for us. So we sell a couple oh here. Gosh. Yeah. And so I'm going to be doing this once I hit 34 weeks just to make sure that I am a more effective pusher. I really know how to relax my pelvic floor because I think also with any type of pain and just being fearful, um, and that's normal when you're about to push a baby out, teaching your body how to release and push something out is really helpful and it really um, helps your tissues stretch. And I know that some women aren't as comfortable doing perineal massage yes. or getting their partner involved in helping them with that. So something else that I wanted to talk about is this type of tool um, along with that. But that's something that if you have overtone, even undertone, just learning um, how to relax that pelvic floor and yeah. you know your your vaginal canal, all of that. You know so, so it's fascinating. I, as soon as you bring that up, like it reminds me that there's such a, there's such stigma around um, elasticity in yes. our vaginas. Like, yes. think about it. Really <gasps> You're stretched tight. out. How dare you? <laughs> we we hear the terms blown out. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, wait. That's what the female body is designed to, to do. do. So this idea that it's going to be like some floppy mess afterwards <laughs> is like what people are really afraid yes, of. Yes. They're and afraid of a hot, throwing a hot dog, what is it? A hot dog down a hallway? Kind yes. Of <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a comment from oh, the right, right, right. Good <laughs> summer. <laughs> says, Nina, I wish I'd known about you when I was pregnant, oh. but I was lucky enough to find Courtney just postpartum with Good. my second. Nearly four years later, I am still mama stronging five days a week. Courtney has totally changed my life physically and beyond. So, so grateful. Oh, what was her name? Maureen. Maureen. Oh, Maureen. Yes. Thank and you. And we also have a question from Ashley from earlier, okay. who was actually with baby number three. Oh. She said, can we address how to hold a baby? Six month old, chunky baby, not a newborn. Yes. And not ruin your pelvic floor by doing it then. Okay. So I'm a big believer that we should learn how to uh, hold babies dysfunctionally. Dysfunctionally. Yes. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> this is a big pet peeve of mine is that um, let's say you're dealing with, let's say you're dealing with pain anywhere or you're trying to figure out how to hold your baby. If you go right. to talk to a traditional uh, body worker or therapist, they're going to tell you to stand up straight mm -hmm. and to hold the baby like this. Right. Well, I really disagree with that because the, the, the whole idea of being maternal and of holding your baby is this. Yeah. And I don't know if you, I mean, holding a baby like this is not only awkward for your body, but the baby doesn't like it. it there is something well. purposeful about this wrapping in and skin Cradling. to skin. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I like to say, well, I'm not gonna tell you not to do that because that seems like a normal, beautiful function. And there's probably some nonverbal communication to the baby that happens in that posture that needs to happen. Okay. Um, relaxation, calm, lack of stress. Mom is able to go into this position. That's going to communicate something to the baby. Whereas right. if you're stiff and holding it like that, yeah. it communicates something very different. So how would you lift the child? 
So what I suggest is first off, work your pelvic floor like crazy so that you can move dysfunctionally. Okay. And anytime I'm holding a baby in this position, I make sure that I'm allowing my body to round. I'm not trying to hold on anywhere. Okay. And I'm simply pressing my belly to the spine. I imagine okay. a tack at my belly button, right. just tacking straight in, very gentle. I'm okay. holding that there. And then really utilizing my arms and my armpits. So I think there's three <laughs> there's three main anchors in the body. Okay. One is the mid back, right at our bra strap. The right. other is at our pelvic floor, right in the center. If you imagine a seed, right at your tailbone. Okay. And the other is your glutes. And so whenever I'm holding children in awkward ways, I go ahead and do it in whatever way is going to be easiest from an engineering standpoint. So right. if you're holding a toddler, kick your hip out, hold the kid like that. You need you need to create that structure, that stance, yeah. And then do it consciously. Okay, I'm in this position. I need to make sure I'm bracing. I need to make sure my pelvis is in the right position and then I'm not forcing anything. And then keep my armpits down, keep my neck long, and just hold. And then your arms come into play at that point. Having okay. strong arms be becomes key, having a strong back. So my question, being pregnant mm -hmm. and having a toddler, yeah. then how would you hold something? Because if I'm standing up, you're, my head gets cut off, sorry y'all. <laughs> um, you know, are you doing the exact same thing, like pretending you have that tack? Um, you know, remaining strong, having that stance, having that baby on your hip, or yeah. because I see so many women like placing their toddlers to on say. their belly, and I'm say. like, ah, I was about to say. <laughs> what are you doing? The, Ouch! <laughs> the, holding the baby on top, child on top of you is so harmful, right? Because you're, and don't be afraid if it happens. Let's say you're in the grocery store and they're having a. And you're not a bad mom if you do that. No. I'm not saying that at all. Okay. But yeah. generally speaking want to put them on your hip. If we look at indigenous tribes and we look at how indigenous women hold their right, babies, right. we need to model off of that because right. they know what's up. They don't have the same uh, you know, idea about what it looks like to be a mom. They're right. doing a lot of the right things with their pelvis. So right. kick your hip out to the side, make sure you're pulling the pelvis back, keeping the tailbone um, heavy, and then make sure you're using your back. Right. So when they're holding, they're really using that mid back. They're right. making sure that they're loading into their torso okay. and loading into the armpits. Armpits okay. become really key. And go ahead and kick that hip out and just awesome. do it consciously. Right. We've got a comment from Mom Strong. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Betsy says, Mom Strong and Courtney equals life changing. <laughs> <laughs> Not only for pelvic floor healing, but also whole body strengthening and only 15 minutes a day. Yay. Wow. Only 15 minutes? Only 15 minutes. You swear? I swear. <laughs> my daughter, my 10 year old, she's like very, she's, well, yeah. She, uh, <laughs> well, she's 10. Yeah. And she's like, actually, Mom. It's not because I have a program called the Daily 15, and she's so upset by it. She's like, it should be called the Daily 18 or 19. Aww. <laughs> because I do. Because you talk. Uh, uh, like an intro, maybe? There's a little tiny intro, and then usually there's a little bit of stretching. Yeah. Uh, so she's like, the stretching counts. She's like, no. And I'm like, well, it doesn't sound as good. But no, it is 15 minutes of exercise. Everything in Mom Strong. I love Some it. of the tutorials go over, but everything. Okay, okay, we have a question too from Vanessa, awesome. and she said, I've been seeing a chiropractor for sciatic pain, and he mentioned my pelvic floor being tilted. What does this mean, and does it affect the actual birth, and if so, is there anything that I can do? Yeah, Courtney. Pelvic floor being tilted. I'm not the chiropractor, so I don't know, and I'm not trying to correct a chiropractor, mm -hmm. um, but she might have heard something. So your pelvis can um, get Tilt. til mm -hmm. til tilted, and it can twist. Like, you can have one side Yes, rotate. my right side is a little bit more rotated than my left, and each time I see my chiropractor, she's like, Nina, that right side of yours, just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so yes. Yeah, so that's probably what he's talking about, is that, um, you know, the pelvis is either two tipped or one side. If you're dealing with sciatica, my hunch is, is that there probably is a slight, a slight tis, a twist happening. Right. And in order to deal with that, it really is all about the hip flexors. So it brings me back to the hip flexors and making sure you're releasing there. So in the human body, we have a working side and a stabilizing side across okay. the board. And most of us say your right side is the dominant side. Mm -hmm. um, this tends to be our working side. This is a side that likes to do things. Yes. Okay. And this side, the left side, hangs out. Is well, it actually is the stronger side oh. because it's always stabilizing. So the muscles, uh, like your glutes and your mid back and your pelvic floor, are actually stronger on the stabilizing side. Very. And the cool. right side is like ready to go. So it's the action muscles that take over. Right. So what happens there is the hip flexor on one side gets really tight and starts to pull the pelvis a bit. And you have these joints at the back of your pelvis called your SI joints, mm -hmm. and those fill up with fluid. 
And when they fill up with fluid, you're going to feel that pain, big right. time pain back there. Right. So in order to address it, you need to make sure you're releasing the hip flexors. And then the thing I always like to say is overdo glute work. So at Mama Strong, we have way too many glute uh, workouts that I talk <laughs> about constantly. Uh, one is called glute blast and the other is uh, called glute camp actually. And both of those work to activate the glutes. And as soon as the glutes are activated, they then work to pull the pelvis into the right position. Yeah. But with people who are really dominant on one side, it's gonna be hard to get that glute to kick in. So that's what um, those programs are all about. Yeah. It's really making sure, it's actually a term that they're using now, um, which body work has been known forever, called dead butt syndrome. Ah. And that's where even when you're trying to, <laughs> even when you're trying to work your glutes, they're not firing. Okay. And so uh, what I teach in Mama Strong is very much all about getting those glutes to fire. That's good to know. Yeah. And I, I will say with the chiropractor, it is normal for your pelvis to tilt during uh, pregnancy. So that's that's not to be nervous about, Vanessa. And, this is um, good and thing that's is, she should probably make sure that any chiropractor you go to is. I'm not saying that yeah, is not is yeah. prenatal certified. Oh, of course, yeah, Webster Technique certified. And more than likely, if there is some type of twist or tilt that. Um, uh, Courtney was talking about they can help correct that throughout your pregnancy and seeing a chiropractor helps so you're doing all the right things so definitely stretching lots of glute work I mean Ina May said it best do 300 squats a day you're gonna give birth really quickly so a really strong trunk and <laughs> pelvic floor can help with all those things so let's get to it I want to learn this bracing method okay. so then we can have stronger pelvic floors Okay. How do I do it? So usually I teach it lying on the ground, but I think okay. for pregnant women, it's actually really helpful um, to just do it while sitting first. You want to get really cozy and okay. you want to not sit in a proper way at all. Like do everything your grandmother told you not that to do. That I'm not do. supposed to do. Lay like, back. Lay back. <laughs> just let your pelvis hang. Okay. And uh, you know, wherever your head needs to go, don't worry about right. that. So you're going to take one hand on the belly. Okay. And you're just going to hold it there and you're going to practice breathing first. So you're just going to take an inhale. And as you inhale, and this is the hardest part for a lot of people, you're gonna inhale and let the belly go out. I'm sure this is a great angle, y'all. I know, this is awesome. We're like <laughs> chin and crotch. I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> hey. Are okay. we good? Is there any, like, okay, good. All right, big, big inhale in, belly up, inhale. you said. Yeah, so like filling up a balloon, inhale. On the exhale, this is the first step. There's three parts to the brace. This is number one. You're gonna imagine that belly button tacking to the spine. Okay. On the exhale. So inhale again, blow up like a balloon. Exhale, imagine a little tack, belly to the spine. Now what happens here when women do this a lot of times, I'm gonna sit in the crack. So go I'm for it, even. go for it. Okay, um, so <laughs> what women do a lot of times at this point is because they've been taught a lot of abdominal work where you squeeze, yes. is that they start to move their back and their pelvis. Right. I want you to hold back from that. So you brace until, you press the belly to the spine until you feel that urge to tuck under. Okay, okay. so again, okay. breathe in. Exhale, belly to the spine without moving the spine. But you can feel how subtle that is, right? Yes, I do. Okay. Very. That's step one. And I can I can feel that having, you know, 27 week baby up in here, I can feel the my core yep. and everything kind of working. You're right, now here's the magic. Get oh, ready. Okay. oh no. So that's step one, <laughs> tacking the belly button. Step two is when you're pregnant, I like to talk about blinking your hoo-ha. <laughs> So, Y'all, did you catch that? I also say <laughs> squeeze your sphincter. Okay. And also Kegel. Okay. But because we all have this weird attachment with squeezing and Kegel, I try to say blink your hoo-ha. We all, we're all doing it right now. You're blinking your hoo-ha. I know. <laughs> I can see it in people's eyes. Okay. So you're going to do that step two. Okay. So you breathe in, belly goes out, and then exhale, pin the belly button, and then blink the hoo-ha. Feel that? Yep. Okay, that's the second step. The third step. And you hold it for how long? Just a second. Just a second. Okay. Just a second. Uh, over time, you can lengthen a little bit, but. My son just kicked me. But it's okay. like, hey, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> You're strengthening down there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then there's a third step. And this okay. step gets a little tricky. Okay. So I have a couple of visuals. One is I imagine, some people like the idea of an elevator. So you imagine that blinking of the hoo ha or mm -hmm. the kegel. And you imagine that then it's going up an elevator, okay? So up floors all the way to the top of the head. Okay. Or the other one I like that I say a lot, and anybody at Momstrong gets so sick of it, is <laughs> claw crane, which is where uh, you know those construction yep. cranes. By the way, yep. I had to Google this because I was like, you know that thing with the claws, and it's like 
<laughs> it's called a claw crane. <laughs> Good to know. Right. It comes down and it scoops and pulls up, right? right? Right. So I love that visual. That one works for me. Another one that works really well for people is a rocket ship. So they imagine that the um, Kegel is like the launch pad and then a rocket ship is shooting up. In essence, the spine, the idea is that the spine is lengthening. What happens with this last step when we do it is that it's gonna integrate this um, pelvic floor work into the abdominal muscles. And okay. that's what's usually missing, is we right. either work just the abdominals or just or the pelvic just the pe floor. You're absolutely right. So we're bringing it all together. Okay. okay. So, comfy, mm -hmm. deep breath in. Exhale, belly to the spine, tack it, Kegel, claw crane, and then release. We'll get to the release in a second. Okay. Practice it again, inhale. Exhale, belly to the spine, Kegel, claw crane. And I'm going to cue it differently this time for anybody who's using different cues. So inhale, exhale, pin the belly button, blink the hoo ha, grow the spine. You feel that a little bit? Yes. Okay. I always feel like when I do these, like people know that I'm doing them. They do. I do. I can tell. <laughs> Yeah, but you are like in this. People probably don't know that you're doing them, but I'm like so yeah. fixated and like focused. I do it when or. I'm in like bad, when I'm in meetings, not bad, bad meetings, I do it. I so mean, how often should women be doing these during pregnancy and then after? So I would say that, you know, if, if you're not used to doing exercise, right. um, you want to try to do it like every hour. So just set a timer mm -hmm. okay. and just do five of them. Five, okay. Um, if you're doing physical movement, I want you to try to think of it the hardest point of the exercise that you're doing. So let's say you're doing a squat. As, as soon as you bend the knees and you're at the lowest point, that's where you want to brace Kegel claw crank. So oh, at the, that's at the, an intense one. Mm -hmm. At the hardest point of all the exercise, you want to do that movement. Okay. okay? So um, if you're doing squats, ladies, during pregnancy or after the six weeks, postpartum you can do the squats and stuff do that yep. when you're at your lowest yes of the squat okay yep. um and then i use other good times to do it are driving excellent time i mean don't lose yes. focus on the road obviously <laughs> you'd be safe. Yeah. do it i always say once you hit a red light yeah every red light that's when you should do that yep yeah um standing in line things mm -hmm. like that now what a lot of people ask at this point is like well how do i do all of that um, and breathe, how do I mix it all together? And I say, just take it easy. Like the breathing is there for a reference point. Mm -hmm. Eventually you'll be able to brace without it. Okay. Um, but for a lot of women, connecting to the pelvic floor requires some of that exhale. So if you're having trouble connect, that breathing becomes important. And in fact, a lot of PTs teach the piston breath, which is as you exhale, instead of just breathing out of the mouth, you actually put the lip over the bottom lip and you go like you're playing a flute. Mm -hmm. And that actually activates the pelvic floor a little bit more. So that's why breathing is important. But over time, you don't have to do it. You don't have to stand in the line at Kroger and be like, <sighs> you know, <laughs> you can still. And I always tell women, if like you're, if you're struggling, you want to put it into everyday life, mm -hmm. just thinking of a gentle pin and a lengthening activates the whole thing and makes it yeah. enough. Um, and I'm sure you'll notice like all of a sudden yourself just standing taller and not tucking your, your, um, your pelvis in anymore, yes. getting that heavy that's pelvis. A, that's a good point. When you're doing it in the standing position, so we did this in the, in the spine sitting. position right, just right. so you didn't activate your, your hip flexors, but when you're doing it standing, you want to make sure the pelvis is tipped. tipped. What I imagine is, this is a terrible image, no, but it works, is when you're standing, you want to imagine, and if you're standing watching, I'll stand up. Yeah, see. go for it. Uh, when you're standing, you want to imagine that, <laughs> I'm going to say hoo-ha again. Uh, <laughs> when most women stand, they tuck the hips under, right? right. And um, imagine that you're on a beam, right? straddling a beam. And what I want all women to imagine is that they slide the hoo-ha back on the beam. So but, just tuck the or push the booty out a little bit. Right, and what people do, if you say stick your booty out, a lot of times they end up doing this move, which yeah. is actually just working the back extensions. I guess, yeah. So you want to think instead, so if the pelvis is here, you want to think instead of just dragging the hoo-ha back, but not lifting it off the beam. So it's just really, when I when I tell guys about it, I tell them, like, crotch back, and they get it. It's the same <laughs> thing, where you're not, you're not lifting the pelvis, off, you're not you're not arching you're just dragging the hoo-ha back behind you yeah and then do the bracing and while you're doing that make sure that you're not tucking under so you pin you blink and you lengthen without moving the spine very cool mm -hmm. oh my gosh <laughs> well now I have a new tool you're trying I'll be sharing <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's great. It works really well. It works really, really well. Awesome. We have a shout out on Mom Strong. Yay! Um, Rachel says, one month of Mom Strong and I'm stronger than I've ever been. It's smart and accessible and fun and it works. 
Thank you, Courtney. Yay, Yay. thank, thank you, you, Courtney. <laughs> That's great. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you all for joining us for our little chat about pelvic floor. I'm sure Courtney will be on her page answering any additional questions, and we'll be on ours as well at Baby Chick. So, yes, we'll continue the convo. And give your info and anything that mom strong people might want. Oh, gosh, I don't know. Um, just baby-chick.com. Yes, baby-chick.com. <laughs> just a resource that you can learn like I said everything for pregnancy birth postpartum uh, and parenting so we have experts in the field that are right for us so we have pediatricians sleep consultants uh, lactation consultants you you name it um, sharing great tips and information to help parents that's along wonderful. the way so uh, that's that's what we wanted to do and mama strong yes and it's only two dollars a month so two bucks that's eight quarters it's worth it's worth a shot. People yeah. always ask like, do you have a free trial? And I'm like, no, because it's two dollars. And I specifically love that it's really geared a lot towards moms. Mom is strong. Women going through all of this, so it's it's completely tailored to you. And I, I just love that. So I'm so glad that you, we got to do this chat. Yeah. We are going to be doing another chat again on Tuesday, August first. And what is our topic again? It's postpartum depression, I believe. So. If you want to join us, we'll be probably on at like 1, 1.30 um, Central Standard Time for talking about postpartum depression. So you don't want to miss it. But anyway, guys, thank you.